So for the talk this evening, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk about this evening, but I'm just going to start and see where it leads. That's always what I get up to. And I'm going to start with one of the stories somebody asked me. They said this was one of their favorite stories and can I talk about it? And we see where it goes to afterwards. And that was the story. It's an old Buddhist story, a long time ago. There was a Buddhist nun who lived in a cave. She lived a very simple life and she was doing a lot of meditation and just doing a lot of meditation in the cave. She, her life was just so easy and simple. In the morning time, she would go on arms round, as the monks do here, like tomorrow. The two of us would go on arms round around Nolamara. And for her, that's where she used to go, and just around the local area where cave was located. And she would receive just a simple amount of food from everybody. If it's just you know, quite a few people supporting you, then just a small amount of food doesn't hardly cost anything at all. Just one nun or one monk is very easy to support. So when she came back after her arms round, that was when she noticed that one of her spare robes, which she kept in her cave, had been chewed by a rat. And it wasn't the first time this had happened. So she had to get out a needle and thread and mend her robe. And as she was mending her robe and she thought, how long it takes you know, to uh, get this robe mended and how she would almost do this every other day because of this mice or rat kept on chewing her robe. And after a while she thought, this is just taking time away from her meditation. Why can't she do something about this? What can you do if you live in a cave? So she thought for a while, and then she decided that the next morning, when she went on arms round, she would ask one of the villagers there if anyone had a spare cat. Because if she had a cat, the cat would, you know, even just the smell of the cat would uh, mean the rat had to find another place to live and another source of food. And so, you know, actually cats are pretty easy to find because when they have kittens, they have so many. So she asked a couple of uh, people and then she got herself a cat. Even here, you know, that sometimes People come to me and they say their cat has had kittens and there's too many of them. Do you want one at your monastery? We used to have cats at monastery, but unfortunately they eat too many of the wildlife down there. But anyway, it's so easy. If someone offers me a little kitten, it's so easy to get a loving home for it. What I did many years ago, the last time that happened, they gave me this kitten and I brought it into this room here. <laughs> When I was meditating, I let it just go loose. And it went on people's laps, rubbed past them, and the cat chose its new owner. Actually, it was almost a fight because two or three people saw that little kitten and said, can I have it please, they got any more? And they said, no, it's already chosen you. And so uh, they took it back and they adopted it. Especially Buddhists, I must admit, you're all such kind, loving people. So if a cat comes here, they really enjoy themselves. We do have another cat who comes here. I haven't seen it this weekend, but it comes here. And imagine a little cat, it lives around the back here somewhere, it's got an owner. But the little cat comes and plays with you and never gets chased away. And sometimes you get special food and that little kitten or cat, it really likes, we found, I tried to give it some milk, it didn't like the milk, it really likes chicken. <laughs> and as soon as I say that, 
people find some chicken somewhere or other and to feed the little kitten. And so the kitten comes and if you're too busy to give it a nice stroke or a pat, it goes to so many other people. It gets patted so much, much more than it will ever get patted in its own home. That's why little kittens or cats, they love this place. Even here I remember once, there was another cat years ago who used to come here every Saturday afternoon. Because Saturday afternoon, after the meditation, it would actually play in a reception area here, crawl all over people, get stroked here, stroked there, get, give them some special treats. And I remember that little cat because then one day, you know, the secretary in there got a call, and it was from the owner of the cat. She said she was moving today. Is my cat there? And I said, yeah, it's here. It's playing with the monks. I said, well, I'm moving today. I've got to come and collect it. And so I remember her coming in and walking into the reception area. And the cat was actually just playing in front of me. And as soon as the cat saw the owner to come and collect it, you know what that cat did? I'm not exaggerating. It jumped right onto my lap. You could read its little cat mind. Sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. But unfortunately, you can't sort of uh, steal it from its owner. So it had to go to its owner. <laughs> Very sad, because a nice little cat. But anyway, so there's lots of cats available. So uh, she got a cat, but then what to do? Because you don't just have a cat, you have to feed the cat. So uh, it shared the arms food, the picuni, the nun shared the arms food with the little cat, but even that wasn't enough for the cat. So the nun had to start asking the people on arms round, look, I've got a cat. Can I have a little bit of milk as well or some fish or whatever you have to feed the cat? And everyone is so generous and kind. And each one of you, are just, it's amazing. If I had a cat and asked for a little bit of milk or a bit of fish, even if vegetarian, you'd probably get me something. And anyway, so that's how they were looking after the little kitten for a while. And as he was looking after the kitten, he thought, this is just a burden for the lay people asking for, for milk all the time. Why don't, why don't I get a cow? Because you know sometimes we have these big occasions, like soon we're going to have our sort of South Asian New Year, and also the Thai New Year, the Song Kwan. That's coming up April the 14th, I think. We're going to have a big ceremony here. And also Vaisak in May. That's all people are just so generous on Vaisak. So we started thinking, well, maybe, maybe on Vaisak we can have a collection together to get a cow. I don't mind milking it. I can do that. I'll be doing it very, very gently. And I can milk the cow to get some, <laughs> some milk for my cat to keep the mice away so I don't have to keep mending the robe. And that would not be such a burden for the lake people who look after me. So they suggested that, and there was no problem at all. Yeah, we can actually do that. So they, they collected some money, and they got a cow. And once they collected some money to get a cow, they didn't need to ask for any milk anymore. But what's a cow going to do to eat? So he managed to ask for some hay, and then he spared grass, you know, for the cow. Now, even right now, we have uh, kangaroos at Bodhidharma Monastery. They're not pets, they're wild kangaroos. But nevertheless, you know, it hasn't rained down in Bodhidharma Monastery for such a long time now. Those poor kangaroos, you just look at them. And you don't need to read their mind, just look at their eyes. You know them for years and years and years. And, you know, they're hungry. So, we did have some pony cubes. And so we feed the little kangaroos some pony cubes. And my goodness, the first time that the monk who was supposed to be doing this just left the bucket out. And all the kangaroos were queued, one after another, you know, to get some pony cubes. Because they were hungry. And of course you want to help. So anyway, 
uh, they, what can they give a cow? A cow's really big and eats a lot. So they got some grass and hay, but that was, you know, really difficult. So then she thought, you know, if, if I had a field, <laughs> then it'd be very convenient for the cow. And I wouldn't have to keep asking people for these things. So they got a nice field. Again, had to get some uh, rich people to loan some money to get a field. And they put the cow in the field and she would go and milk it every day and get, take the milk for the cat to feed the cat to keep the mice away so she didn't need to keep amending her robes. And so the cow was in the field. But you know, it's sometimes you, know, you might look for the cow and the cow's on the other part of the field. And that's one of the reasons, actually, why we bought Bodhinyana Monastery. Before we were there, there was a man who was uh, grazing cows and sheep on that piece of property. But he said it was just so hard to actually to find those cows and sheep, especially when they never wanted to be found. I try and find a monk in that monastery. <laughs> I know they're there somewhere, but if they don't want to be found, there's so many places they can hide so many rocks and valleys and stuff. So anyhow, he said, no, okay, this is just too hard to actually to graze animals when you want to find them afterwards. So he sold it to us for a very cheap price. I still remember actually how much, I think it was $90,000 for 100 acres. Perfect for us. But anyway, I won't go there because you've criticized me for uh, doing what I'm trying to tell you not to do through the story of the, the, monk, the, the nun who got a cow in a field just to try and make sure she didn't have to sew her robes. So she had a cow in the field, she go there every day to milk the cow. But then she thought, that's a lot of work, you know, milking the cow and making sure there's enough grass there and nothing's wrong with the cow. So she decided to get like an attendant. If you have an attendant, you know, we do have those things. And those of you who've been to monastery, you see these attendants. I don't know if you realize the next Thursday that one of our attendants, we call them Anagaricas, is taking the novice ordination. That's Ryan. Ryan's uh, family. Wednesday. Wednesday, yes. Very good, okay. We just wanted to make sure there wasn't too many people there. <laughs> <laughs> if I say it's... <laughs> The next Wednesday, his family have come all the way over from Texas. It's a long way because they value this opportunity to see their son. If the son was getting married, of course they'd come over. This is much better than getting married, becoming a novice. All that wisdom and the kindness and the help they have. And it really does, is a blessing for the family if somebody becomes a monk or a nun. I still remember Venerable Nito when he wanted to become a, a novice and then a monk. And it's part of our rules, you have to get permission from your parents before you can ordain. And so he wrote to his uh, parents and they said, I think his mother replied, yes, you can ordain. Actually, this is the wrong story. <laughs> Not that he has to ordain. Actually, no, this was one of the other monks, Venerable Sunyo. He's down at Bodhinyana Monastery now. Venerable Sunyo he said, can I ordain? Asked his mother. And his mother replied, only if, you know, the monastery where you're ordaining respects women. His mother was really firm. They didn't want anybody to join a community which didn't respect you know, equity. Not another sort of patriarchy just run by men for men and women just had no respect. And that was when he said, oh no, Ajahn Brahm got into a lot of trouble for ordaining women. And his mother said, yes, okay, that's the monastery where my son can ordain. That was that story, but the real story I was going <laughs> 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 to stay with Venerable Nito. Because you know, sometimes parents, family don't understand the value of being a monk or nun. It's not just good karma, it's just the qualities which they can bring to the family. And this was when Venerable Nito wanted to go and visit his family because his father had a heart attack and was just desperate, you know, for, for some help. 
So he wrote to his family, can I come and stay? And they said, yes, you can visit. It would be lovely to see you, but we don't want to see you in a brown robe. We'll have a suit ready for you when you land. Imagine. <laughs> and he showed me the letter, and he was really disturbed. You know, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, if they don't want you to see you in a brown robe, fair enough, but no suit. Tell them it's either the brown robe or naked. <laughs> Please make your choice. <laughs> and he followed my advice, and that's what he wrote to his mother. I was, okay, okay, you can wear your brown robe. So anyway, he went there, and his father died. You know, the heart attack was very serious. And then afterwards, I always remember after about two or three months, you know, he was looking after the family, arranging the funeral and everything. And after those months, his, uh, uh, his elder brother wrote to me. He said, Ajahn Brahm, I apologize. This, you know, how we made it so difficult for our younger brother, Ajahn Nita, you know, to come over here. We never understood you know, what the training of a Buddhist monk was. I said, we still don't know exactly, you know, how you train him, but it's changed so much, and without him, our whole family would be such a mess, you know, going through our father's funeral. So I just want to let you know on behalf of all the family, please, we're so happy he's a monk, and he can go back to Bodhinyana Monastery for as much as he wants. Thank you. Those are the sorts of compliments I really love. He's now over in Norway trying to set up something for Buddhists in Norway. But uh, for this uh, bhikkhuni, you know, she, uh, she was well enough respected, but now she decided she needed an attendant because the attendant would be able to take on all those chores of you know, looking after the cow making sure that the field was properly protected, milking the cow every day and bringing the milk to her so she could give the cat some milk and keep the mouse away. And it was going all very well, but then you can't just keep like a young boy. Where's a young boy going to sleep? He's the attendant. You can't sleep in the cave with a nun. So, she decided she'd have to build the attendant a nice little hut. Now the huts are not expensive to build, but it's quite a bit of work, so she had to ask you know, the lay people again, can we get some wood and some nails to make a hut for my kid so he can actually sleep there? And he said, while well, she was thinking about it, you know, sometimes she still needs to go to school. So, you know, can we sort of get a nice school close by for my boy so he's well looked after? And then she got so busy trying to get school books for the attendant and build a hut for him. And <laughs> just so that he could go and look after the cow to get milk for the cat to keep the mouse away. And then one day somebody came up to her and asked her a question about Dhamma, you know, like you asked the monks here. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I've got no time. <laughs> she was so busy with all those duties and responsibilities. But at least she was wise enough to know what the problem was. So afterwards, she gave away the field, told the boy to go home, and didn't continue building his little hut outside the front of the cave. Uh, gave the cow away, and the field away, and uh, found a nice home for the little cat. And then, without a cat, without the, the cow, without the milk, without the field, without all of those possessions, she went out one morning for arms round, and when she came back, she found a big hole in her robe. The mouse had come back. And very happily, she sewed up the hole in her robe and put a patch on it and never complained again. 
<laughs> and that little story is basically about our life. You have a nice little house. Then you want it bigger. Why do you want it bigger? Now, fortunately, I've got a brother. I remember his house. His kids have all grown up and moved out. And the house is huge. They've got a family room, a TV room, a this room, and a that room. And all, what do you want all that for? Because you need to keep the mouse away, therefore you need a cat, and need a cow, and a field, and someone to look after all of that. Have you seen that's just the way that we get sucked in to this world of so much busyness, so much work? And that more than anything else, call it materialism, it actually takes away our peace and happiness in our world. It's convenient, but troublesome. I remember one of the monks used to like that word. He was a Thai monk, and he couldn't understand much English, but those are the two words he learned when he came over to Perth and spent some time here. Convenient, but troublesome. <laughs> so after a while, simplicity, when you really understand it, you see it, you get to know it. It can seem ascetic and austere for some, but for others it gives you a great sense of freedom. Now how can you actually understand that even more freely and deeply? How many other people in the world talk like this? If you pick up a... Actually, do you have newspapers these days? Or do you watch everything on the internet? Even the, B, even the BSWA podcasts or YouTube, are there advertisements on it? Yay! Well done, BSWA. You know that some years ago when I was teaching in New York, and I went into the Google headquarters over in New York, and they were actually asking me, why don't you, look at John Brown, you can make a lot of money for the BSWA. You know, you can actually uh, have better facilities, you know, over in Nolamo. You can do all sorts of stuff. All you need to do is do advertisements, you know, on the YouTube channel. All I need to do is, under my robe, all I need to do is have this little advertisement, Ajahn Brahm drinks Dilma, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's not lying, that's what I do, you can make a fortune that way. <laughs> but, but there's something which is not right about that, it's breaking that beautiful simplicity and peace. You're not doing this to try and make money. In fact, sometimes, okay, I, can I admit this? Sometimes I make sure that sometimes when we raise money for something, we give it to somebody else, not to Bodhinyana. It's on purpose. Because if the monks have it too easy, and they don't know the simplicity, they're missing out on the meaning of monastic life. Yeah, make it reasonable enough to eat, a roof over your head, but how much more do you need? One of the monks for years has been asking me to have a jacuzzi somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> if he's listening to this, <laughs> it's true, you have been asking me, but <laughs> what do you want one for? And honestly, just when I was in Hong Kong recently, the, one of the people who were supporting me, she was actually the owner of this hotel. So she gave me this really big room to stay in. It didn't have a jacuzzi, it did have a bath. And my, okay, Gerald, it's nothing to do wrong with you, you're a very, very kind man. But he said, Ajahn Brahm, there's a bath here. Why don't you use it? And I said, I haven't used the bath for 10 years. We worked that out. And he said, but you know, 10 years, and no one will criticize you for having a hot bath. So it was really on my case when I kept on refusing. So one afternoon I said, okay, I promise I'll have a hot bath. And 
that's a trouble with me. When I promise, I have to keep promises. I can't sort of say no afterwards. So I had a hot bath. It was really boring. What's what you have a hot bath for? <laughs> You're just sitting in hot water. <laughs> What's the deal? <laughs> and honestly, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't un unpleasant. It was just, what do you do? <laughs> I didn't have any rubber ducks or anything like that. <laughs> But nevertheless, it's the thing with being a monk, you question everything. If you had a hot bath, why would you have a hot bath? The only reason is because people say, oh, it's really good having a hot bath. You haven't lived until you've had a hot bath. You haven't. All those advertisements which you see on TVs or on internet, all this other stuff, you buy into that. And that's something which even as a young man I just saw through. You know what I did once? I'd seen this advertisement on TV. This was when I was a student, okay? I was supposed to be intelligent. <laughs> I wasn't. So the advertisement was St. Bruno Tobacco. If you had these pipes, okay, I was at a good university, you're supposed to have pipes in your university. That makes you know, it's like a symbol of being clever. I don't know where I got that idea from anyway. Einstein had a pipe. <laughs> but anyway, so I had a pipe and some Bruno tobacco, I saw it on the TV, you put the tobacco in there and you lit, lit it. The advertisement on the TV, this young guy, ordinary looking guy, not particularly you know, big or handsome or anything, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was walking down the street and he took out the pipe, put the tobacco in it and lit it. And just, this was in the 70s, okay? And after lighting the, the pipe with tobacco in, then, just as he walked past this, this news agent shop, this incredibly beautiful young lady smelt the aroma of the tobacco. And look, I've, I've been past newsagent shops, I've never seen anyone that beautiful actually working in a newsagent. <laughs> she was totally entranced. And she just left her workstation and just was following him. <laughs> And then he went past the green grocer or something, you know, selling fruit and vegetables. And another beautiful brunette, you know, just saw, smelt the, the aroma and just followed him as well. After a few minutes, it's only a short advertisement, had all these incredible drop dead gorgeous girls just following him. And it's, it's insane, isn't it? That doesn't happen. It goes against all sorts of ideas of sanity. But guess who tried it? <laughs> <laughs> I admit to that idiocy. And I, I went down one of the streets in Cambridge. <laughs> I did. I took out tobacco, put some, some, uh, some Bruno tobacco in it, lit it. And the only thing which followed me was a dog. <laughs> But it's just, I don't know why, but it's just a sort of gradual psychology and it just makes you do these stupid things. How much do you really need? And sometimes people ask me, you know, what do I have? But then sometimes they don't ask what I have, you can find out what I have. You know, I don't usually lock the doors of my office or my, uh, my cave. In fact, I let you come and see my cave. Usually on any time there's a big occasion, you can go up and see my cave, see how I live and what's inside of it. What's inside of it? You've all seen it. You can actually, best thing to do is look underneath the mattress, see what I've stuffed on. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> and the reason is because I kind of love that simplicity. 
it's so easy. And I, actually, I don't usually clean up my hut because usually people go there, like Nicholas, and get in there and clean it up. How long does it take to clean up my cave? An hour? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Crikey. Sorry? 15 minutes, that's more like it. <laughs> and because when you actually see what's actually in there, there's nothing, it's so simple to do. How many, much time do you spend on your home, home, housework? Even when you go home today, tonight, it just is there so much stuff to clean up? Can't you live a more simple life? And after so many years of living in that cave, I just love that place. You don't need anything. So anyway, sometimes if it's ever like a birthday, please don't give the monks more cakes. You're killing them. <laughs> There's so much sugar and cholesterol and stuff. So instead, sort of sometimes people say, well, can we give you a gift? They said, what do you want? A few people have done that. They've found out what I really like. You know what I really like? I've had it many times. You just, you open up the little present, beautifully wrapped, and you open it up, and it's empty. Thank you. Just what I always wanted. Nothing. Okay, it's kind of radical to give a birthday present and there's nothing inside of it. And that's really what you do want. And it's not a joke, it's actually honest. Because what that really means is when people give things to a monk, you know what we need? What we want? A lot of time when you give stuff to us, it goes in a charity bin. You've got to try and get rid of it somehow. <laughs> and you can't just throw it away because you know you went spent all that time getting it for us. When you give me nothing, nothing is very easy to share. <laughs> and you're challenging the materialistic, well, you don't need so much. What you do really need is the energy, so you don't feel so tired, cleaning things, mending things, and just going out buying things. There's one of these guys once, he turned up here with a big TV set. A big, was it plasma screen TV set? He said, Ajahn Brahm, can I offer this TV set to you? I said, why? I don't have a TV. I don't use it. You may be able to use it in the monastery for showing videos. No, we don't need that. Okay, he said, okay, can I give it to the, the Buddhist Society of West Australia here? for showing videos. No, we don't need one. And then I asked him, I said, you should have known better than that. He was uh, one of our committee members. <laughs> I thought he would know better. <laughs> and then he said, well, why did you buy it? And that was the interesting question, because he gave an honest answer. He said, because it was on sale. Now, as a guy, I just can't understand that. You buy it because it was a bargain. That's materialism has really got you. You don't need to do that just because it's a bargain. It's amazing just if you don't have that. How much more peace can you have? Even one of the ladies was asking me beforehand, before I came in here, that her children are watching the uh, stuff on the internet too much on tablets and internet and I don't know what else you watch on it. But a lot of times, you know, if you actually look what's on there, is that really important? Is that really going to help you have this beautiful relationship with your parents? They are worried about you. So it's a, a wonderful thing. I did actually tell a story, I shouldn't have told this, but apparently it was a true story some years ago about one of the kids here in Perth. He was watching too much stuff on the internet 
And his parents said, no, just turn that off, that's bad for you. And they had a big argument. And so later on, he decided to prove the point that he was very smart and he invented a video game. And it really took off, made him a couple of million dollars. And his parents never argued with him again. <laughs> That's your true story. But nevertheless, it's not a good story to tell because your children may use that excuse. Instead of like, you know, what is your happiness? What is, your, what is the benefit? And sometimes just instead of actually uh, looking at some video of some place of nature, why not go out into the streets to the nearest park and actually look at a tree? I don't know if any of you, uh, when I used to look at the newspapers as well, I used to just look at the cartoons, still do. The cartoons, I think, tell you much more about society than any long article written by a philosopher or a sociologist. But I remember one of those cartoons by Lunig. Remember Lunig? I think some of you recognize the name. I think it's this Mel Melburnian. He's very rebellious and he sees things in a totally different way. I remember one of my favorite cartoons of Lunig was when his family were just watching this beautiful sunset on the TV. And I was on the left half of the frame of the cartoon, on the right half of the cartoon was the window where the sunset was actually happening. <laughs> and it was a wonderful, very simple but powerful comment. Why do we need to, f to manufacture our understanding of nature when it's right out there, ready to be felt, to be seen? in the raw, live. Why do you all come such a long way you know, to see these talks by the monks and the nuns live? Is it better to see it live or to see it on the YouTube channel? If it was not Ajahn Brahm giving the talk but Taylor Swift would you queue up for hours to get a ticket? <laughs> or would you just watch it on YouTube? In your own home, whenever you want. <laughs> it's obvious, isn't it? You know, just being alive, somehow there's something more gets across. I have to mention that tale from Indonesia. When I was giving a talk in Medan a few years ago, and you know, some of those talks, because they don't see you very often, I have to hire a big hall for these talks. And so the year before, too many people came for my talk. And because of that, there was causing a lot of difficulty, and even a traffic jam around, honestly, not joking, and the, the police realized, goodness, we can't keep having this every year when Ajahn Brahm comes to give a talk here. And so they decided to limit the numbers by selling tickets, only for 50 cents. I wouldn't allow them to sell it for, you know, for real money. It's just very cheap tickets, just to make sure that everyone had to register so they could limit the numbers. And I think there was, I think the hall was about 3,000 or 4,000 people. And so anyway, my tickets sold out in 20 minutes. At the same time, uh, this uh, pop star, Lady Gaga, <laughs> she was giving a concert, I, think, I don't think it was cancelled in the end, but anyway, she was giving a concert in Jakarta and her tickets sold out in 40 minutes, mine in only 20 minutes. <laughs> and they announced that at the beginning, <laughs> at the beginning of the talk. The Ajahn Brahm is more popular than Lady Gaga. I've never seen Lady Gaga, so I'm not quite sure if that's a good comparison. <laughs> but nevertheless, the idea of seeing something live is you do get much more information, much more of a, a, a transmission, if you wish to call it, than if you just see it on a YouTube. And especially with nature. You can't compare, actually, 
remember just one of my memorable evenings when I was at Cambridge. I remember the Astronomical Society. So I could go into this very old observatory. You know the ones with the big dome? And you can sit in this chair and the whole thing moves around. It was all moving around and then just raise the telescope, a huge thing. I think it was, I think the one which they discovered Uranus or Pluto or something in those days. And anyway, that see Saturn, you know, live, you know, with all the rings. And it was actually, you were seeing it. It wasn't a photo, it wasn't a picture. It was really hard to anyone to get me out of that chair when you had something so beautiful you were seeing. A real nature. It wasn't a photo, it wasn't uh, made up, it was real. And that reality of seeing something so big and so beautiful and so clear, one of these old telescopes has stayed with me for the last 60 years, I don't know, 55 years. So that's real. That's one of the reasons why the reality is far more powerful, always will be, than seeing things on an internet. Hopefully, when people see the more beauty and uh, understand reality much stronger than just seeing things which you know are very unreal, I think that would help a lot of people. And it's okay to be online but not too much. And simplify your life. What do you really need? When you find out what you really need, it's like peace, contentment, where you don't need anything at all. If somebody came and asked you, if you, when you went outside you found this ancient bottle and you rubbed it, and a genie came out and said, I'll give you three wishes. What would you say? Sorry? Yeah, nothing. So, get out of here. I'm not playing with you. But honestly, and to finish off this talk with one of the deeper similes for those of you who stayed to be able to listen to this. That was just the story of the five children playing the wishing game. This is the best description of Nibbana, the goal of Buddhism, that I've ever heard. Five children were playing a wishing game. If you had a wish, what would it be? And a person who came up with the best wish would win that wishing game. So the first child said, if I uh, had a wish, I'd wish for a new computer game. Fair enough. Second kid, if you had a wish, what would it be? And the second kid said, I would wish for a computer game shop. Then I won't have just one computer game. I can upgrade every time I want. I own a shop. And the third kid said, if I had a wish, I would wish for $10 billion US, not Australian. You never know this government. Because <laughs> with $10 million US, billion, so not million, billion dollars US, I can buy my own computer shop. But every kid knows the trouble with playing with computers, especially as a kid, the parents always say, you've got to do your homework first. So, with the what's left over after buying my own computer shop, I buy my own school. And I'll enroll myself in my own school because I pay the teachers and the principal. There's no way they can tell my mum that I'm not doing any work. Otherwise, I'll sack them. And I always give myself the top marks. You know, even though you just have these assessors, you know, from, uh, from what, what they call it, just Office of education or whatever, I don't know. I'm sure with that amount of money I can bribe them to pass me. And then once I graduate from my own uh, primary school, I can buy my own high school. 
and then I can buy my own university. If I buy my own university, I can give myself honorary degrees. So I can play computer games all the time. My mother can't stop me. And when I think of something else to do, with you know, $10 billion US, you, know, you can't spend that in a lifetime. So that was the kid with the $10 billion wish. That's only kid number three. Who still had two more kids to go yet. So the fourth kid said, if I had a wish, I would wish for three wishes. That's a wish. <laughs> for my first wish, I wish for $10 billion US. No. For my first, yeah, first wish, $10 billion US. For the second wish, I wish for the computer game shop. And for my third wish, I wish for three more wishes. <laughs> that way I can go on forever. How many of you, if you haven't heard this story before, can actually conceive, or if you, if you haven't heard it? Yeah. Oh, that's really good. How can you conceive of a wish which would easily beat the infinity of wishes granted. Oh yes, yeah, that's right, the third wish was three more wishes had gone forever. How can you do better than infinity of wishes granted? That fifth child said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed any wishes ever again. That's contentment. Peace. You don't need any more wishes. That's enlightenment. So content, you never needed any more wishes ever again. And of course, that is a nice way of finishing off the story of the nun. Yeah, she had uh, to do some sewing every day, but that's much better than having all of the difficulties in having cows and cats and milk and land and stuff. You know, we always try to keep things simple as monks. But it's always a difficulty. Please help us. Don't give us any donations tonight. Instead, for those who didn't see the beginning, This is a Buddha statue for the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project because they just moved in today. Anyone who's interested in just celebrating that by the doing a fundraising for a Buddha statue, they're just, uh, uh, one of their disciples is going to get for them. That's over here. So thank you again for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay. So any questions, comments or complaints? Yes? Okay. S s yeah. How can we stay in the state of satisfaction? One is way is to hang out with lots of other people who understand that highest happiness of satisfaction. If you hang out with other people, they say, you're crazy, you're mad, there's something wrong with you. But other people, it's like association with the wise. Staying with other people who are kind, wise, and understanding, realize you don't need much. That makes sense? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We got any questions on the internet? We do, but the internet is broken, so. <laughs> thank you, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. I've got three for you that I can tell you. Oh. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> okay, so first question is, uh, it is easy to get caught up in worldly things and forget to be grateful for where and what I have right now. How do I not get caught up in worldly things? Okay, again, just keep that 
closer in the center of your mind, just what you have right now. And one of those little statements, which I always keep in my mind, well, not always, but just almost every day, is when you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. It's a lovely little statement, could have been said by the Buddha, although it was said by uh, another wise person. When you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. So again, not getting caught up in more things. Look, how much can you afford? You look at your house, how much does it cost? How much you have to worry, interest rates go up, interest rates go down, you want to extend this, clean that, fix that. It's wonderful being in a cave, you, you can't extend it. You can't fix anything. It's underground, so the council can't see it. It's nice and peaceful. I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm keeping the answers simple as well. Next okay. question. Yep, there's a next one, which is, what is the correlation between morals and wisdom, and could somebody get wisdom without having a moral code? Could someone get wisdom without having a moral code? If you get wisdom, then a the moral code will follow immediately afterwards. This I'm just almost remembering my own life story. That just I was meditating, and then it's when you meditate, you know, your mind becomes clear. You think for yourself, and there's no way that I ever wanted to be immoral. It wasn't I was trying to be a goody goody, and that's one of the reasons why, for many people, they find it very difficult when you start to say precepts and five precepts, and eight precepts, and ten precepts, and 227 precepts, and 311, oh my goodness. So I always remembered the fundamental Buddhist precepts, just two precepts. Can you remember those? Two precepts. Never do anything which harms another being. Never do anything which harms oneself. And all the other precepts, even the ones for monks and nuns, all come from those two. And that's actually how the Buddha advised his son Rahula to practice. Never doing anything which harms another being. Never doing anything which harms oneself. And even learning how to live simply is like that. It harms yourself. All that stuff you have to look after in life ties you. Okay, try the next one. Yep, this is the last one. So the last one is, what is the difference between right effort in achieving worldly things, e.g. passing exams, and right effort in, noble, in the Noble Eightfold Path? Okay, the right effort in the Noble Eightfold Path is like a renunciation. It's a very deep and powerful question. It's the... Uh, the skill in letting things go, not in doing things. Look, if you pass examination, I shouldn't say this for people in school, if you pass examinations in school, you have another examination to take next year. There's no end of examinations. Do examinations really reflect your skill base? Just how wise, compassionate and caring you are? There's too many really important qualities in a human being you cannot sort of measure through a test. That's why even there was enough wise people in the university I went to, they wrote really nice graffiti on the walls. Exams kill by degrees. In other words, that people knew how to pass exams. They didn't know what the subject really was about. They couldn't actually test it deeper. There was one of the other, and this was actually on the walls of the philosophy department. Well, no, was it? It was, uh, to be is to do. That was René Descartes, French philosopher. And it was Jean-Paul Sartre who turned it around. Not to be is to do, to do is to be. 
and the third line. And I know I've seen this repeated many times afterwards, but this was in 1969 I saw this. Uh, to, do, to be is to do, René Descartes, to do is to be Jean-Paul Sartre, and it was summed up by the great American philosopher, do be do be do Frank Sinatra. <laughs> there was something rebellious about that which made you think more deeply. It was not a sort of knowledge which was a bunch of thoughts which you had to remember, never question. That's one of the reasons why one of the great articles of wisdom is where everyone thinks the same, no one thinks at all. And that's what happens with exams. Train everyone to think the same, no one thinks at all. And the world gets lost. Okay, thank you all for listening. Is there any more questions from the floor? Sorry? Okay, as long as it's a question and not a comment. No? Okay, hot bath, okay. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no, I no. When it's the cold. No, I was just talking about myself. I don't know how other monks feel. <laughs> oh, we didn't have any other monks in the bath, just me. <laughs> I'm a good monk. <laughs> and I just, I just can't understand it. It just, it, you know, it. I kind of like cold weather, and if it's really cold, you put another robe on, or turn a heater on. That's good enough. Ah. Oh. Anyway, doesn't want to go. It's okay. I'll be back next week. <laughs> Don't need to cry too much. <laughs> but no, just for the hot bath. Just why? It's not really that. Because really. if I want to relax. You know what I do, don't need hot water. You just close your eyes and meditate. You get way more relaxed than any hot bath. Yeah. Indeed. Can that be done? Of course you can. But that's an excuse for many things. And of course, one of those comments is that the one who walks the middle way gets hit by traffic coming in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is that okay for tonight? Okay, very good. So thanks again, everyone, for listening. Those who want these little posters on helping the, celebrating the, the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK, they're just available here. But now we can pay respects to the Buddha Dharma Sangha, and then any personal questions you can come up and ask afterwards. Mm-hmm. <laughs>